See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. We're very different industries, the financial industry and then healthcare industry. We're so different from one another and what we do on a day-to-day basis. But I think what's so beautiful about a conversation like this is we're seeing so many similarities. I have participated in probably over 150 conversations in the last couple years about how companies make investments. There's a lot of notions around, is it better to make a people-based investment or a place-based investment? And my answer is simple. The answer is both. You know, opening a nursing school in this rural area, that's another blessing. There are so many of us, who, when we graduate from my area, we have to leave home if we expect to be anything of ourselves. And, and I hate that. You know, our families are here. This is where we want to be. We can learn from one another about ideas that can be instituted on the education side from our business partners in the community. And we probably need to have more dialogue with other industries because I do think there's some lessons learned there. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. In recent years, industries across the world have experienced seismic disruptions to their workforces, cascading factors including a global pandemic, massive supply chain disruptions, a significant push for flexible and remote work, and an aging, retiring workforce have played a role. Among affected workforces, transportation, construction, food service education, and as the headlines across the world make clear, healthcare have been particularly hard hit. These sectors currently face high numbers of vacancies and projected workforce shortages. The International Council of Nurses estimates that the world could be short 13 million nurses by 2030. Much of this concentrated in low- and middle-income countries, unless action is taken to protect nurses, stem the tide of attrition, encourage experienced nurses to return, and educate and prepare new nurses to enter the healthcare workforce. These dynamics are playing out in every country, including the U.S., where an estimated 275,000 new nurses are needed by 2030 to ensure safe, quality health care is available for all. And just as it plays out on the world stage, lower income and lesser resourced regions of the U.S. feel the vacancies and shortages most acutely, giving rise to all manner of health and economic disparities. Faced with this perfect storm of trends, attracting and supporting the next generation of nurses, nurse educators, and students is top of mind for community, business, and nursing leaders, as well as academic institutions, workforce commissions, and healthcare organizations. In our Meeting of Minds series, we listen in on conversations nurse executives are having with colleagues from a wide range of disciplines and industries in order to discover new ideas, insights, and approaches for addressing similar challenges to spur greater innovation. In this episode, we hear two business leaders and a nursing student compare notes on building opportunity in under-resourced communities and supporting the current and future workforce, while simultaneously achieving business enterprise goals. We learn how a nursing school in rural Kentucky and a financial services call center in Chicago's Southside are providing wraparound services, ensuring students and employees have the social, economic, and practical assistance they need to build their careers, sustain their communities, and succeed in their programs and positions. Let's listen in. Hi, I'm Dr. Audrea Dinker. I'm the Executive Vice President of Nursing for Galen College of Nursing. I've been with the college for 18 years, and prior to that, I was in leadership at a large healthcare organization. Moving to the education side of things really did open my eyes 
to a lot of the challenges of nursing students. And what I found was the ability to complete the college coursework was not the obstacle. The obstacle was family issues, financial issues, social issues. We had students who didn't have housing, were living out of their cars and coming into the school and washing up to go to class. Those that had food scarcities and couldn't afford books, couldn't afford uniforms. We did have some academic challenges, so tutors were needed as well as other things. And so it makes you take a a step back and evaluate how we're delivering the education and how do we holistically educate the student and address some of those issues. I have a student with me, uh, Emily, and I'll I'll refer to her. My name is Emily Fairchild. I live in Paintsville, but I commute to Hazard School Monday through Friday. Both towns are very small and family-based. You can tell everyone wants to come together as a community and help one another, and in doing so, take stress off of nurses, nursing students. And, you know, in regards to the drive, I'm very blessed that, you know, this might be an hour and a half drive for me, but that is so much better than me having to move states to go to a university for nursing or whatever the degree may be. I'd much rather take this hour and a half drive to work on my education versus moving away from my friends, my family, being in a state I don't know anyone. I just, I'm very, this is an awesome opportunity. To Emily's point in Eastern Kentucky, people are used to driving sometimes up to an hour and a half or two hours to get to school, to get to work. The opportunities are not as vast as what you may see in an urban area. And uh, that's what makes a nursing program in an area like that so important. So we've graduated over 500 nurses from that campus. And you would think, how do you graduate 500 nurses between 2017 and now with a community of only 8,000 people? But we had students coming from 29 counties and three states to attend that campus there. And it just goes to show you that there was a lot of rural communities that were struggling. And I know, Watis, you actually kind of had the same mission and vision in opening some opportunities in the Chicago area. So tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. So I'm Watis Gavings, born and raised in the great city of Chicago. Love everything about the city. But if we're being transparent, the city has 77 neighborhoods and not all of those neighborhoods are created equal. But over the last three years in the city of Chicago, I've worked for Discover a financial service firm, actually was at the firm for 12 years, but spent the last three years building an operations center on the south side of Chicago in the community that has a history of being significantly disinvested in. So if you think about, you know, larger corporations joining communities and then deciding to pack up and leave, that leaves a hole in the infrastructure and the overall well-being or quality of life of, of residents. Um, the neighborhood in which I worked in was a, a neighborhood in Chicago called Chatham. And the beautiful part about Chatham is Chatham has a long history of dedicated residents, strong small businesses, amazing nonprofits and elected officials and faith leaders. But over the course of time, Chatham is a community that has been impacted by centuries of of systematic racism. So if you think about, uh, you know, one of the the stories of Chatham I used to tell is Chatham used to historically be governed by mom and pop businesses. So that's grocery stores, pharmacies, bookstores, etc., And then you have big box retailer come into the community, which could be viewed as a positive thing. uh, But the challenge is the small businesses can't compete with them. So they, you know, end up having to close their doors. And then the retailer decides that doing work in the neighborhood is, is, is too difficult or too complex. And they decide to leave too, you know, leaving food deserts or pharmacy deserts or, you know, healthcare deserts, et cetera. So it's been an honor of a career over the last three years, really understanding, you know, what black and brown people need to thrive. And that's a place where they can have a true sense of belonging, a, a place where, you know, all their needs are met, not just from a 
economic perspective, but also mental health, physical health, etc. So super excited to be a part of the conversation today to discuss some perspectives on where the gaps are and, and, and what we could do as we try to move the conversation forward. Just to give you a little background on Hazard, Kentucky, the city has about 8,000 people. But um, one thing uh, I just wanted to bring up is partnerships. And partnerships are so important. Partnering with the community, partnering with other businesses, partnering with government to create these opportunities. And, and you know, the number one obstacle to going to nursing school is financial. And when we started the campus in Eastern Kentucky in Hazard, the first thing that we figured out was how much out of pocket that a student would have if they went to Galen and it came out to about $7,000. And so we uh, partnered with Appalachian Regional Healthcare, which is the hospital system there, and Eastern Kentucky Centralized Employment Program to create scholarships, $7,000 scholarships for our students, leading to the students graduating with zero debt and being able to go and work and change the lives of their family. Watis, did you have any partnerships uh, or anything like that that you worked through when you started your program? Absolutely. And I think what you described is, is amazing, especially when you think about something as necessary and needed as education. So for example, the work that we did in Chatham, the goal was to employ a thousand people. And we are super proud of the thousand jobs and also very proud of the wage, entry-level wage of $18 per hour, but quite honestly, acknowledging that it's not enough. And so we had to rely on strategic partnerships to figure out, like, how do you not only just get people into a financial services career, but how do you make sure that they can have a longevity and career where they experience increase in finances and things as they go along? And so one of my favorite strategic partnerships that we had was in partnership with Chicago State University. Um, And similar to what you're doing in the nursing field, it's important that not only students have access to good education, but they also can do that debt free. And so any of our employees who chose to go back to get a post-secondary degree would have that covered books, tuition and fees, which is pretty significant for you to be able to work full time and then have a college campus less than a mile away. From you can accomplish some of your educational goals. And then once you're graduated or completed the certificate program, then you're able to use that for internal mobility with inside the firm to continue to increase your earning potential. So that's one of my favorite partnerships, but also partnerships with local community-based organizations. You know, people talk a lot about social determinants of health. I like to talk about social determinants of employment as well. And when you think about things such as, you know, transportation or mental health needs or childcare, et cetera, all of those things can make a difference in someone's ability to grow and sustain a career. So having strategic partnerships where we have an on-site therapist that works full-time, where there is a on-site nurse practitioner that works full-time as well, you know, all of those things matter to make sure that people aren't just becoming employed, but they could actually sustain a pretty fruitful career by having their wraparound services met. I love when you said social determinants of employment. I'd never thought about that before. And, you know, I love that you brought up the investment employees because one thing that we had to do, you know, nurse educators are not readily available. There's a lot of competition between schools of nursing to recruit those people, especially when we went to Eastern Kentucky, when very few of the nurses in the that area even had a master's degree, which is what is required to teach in the classroom. So we made an investment in our employees. We have a master's in nursing education. So what we decided to do was to grow our own nurse educators. We have a teaching and learning academy, which once they get their education, it teaches them how to teach. So we take that education a step further and uh, we support them through mentoring, through extensive onboarding and different things like that. And the average age of a nurse educator right now in the United States is 56 to 58 years old. And the average age of a nurse educator at our organization is 44. And that's because we knew that we would have a hard time competing with all the other schools out there. We also compete with the hospitals. So 
the best thing to do is for us to invest in our own employees. And we made a significant investment in the employees in Eastern Kentucky. Several of them graduated from our program and are now teachers. The other thing that you mentioned that I think is just so important is mental health. And a lot of people, either because they don't know where to seek the services or they're afraid they can't afford the services, or maybe even just think there's a a stigma attached to it and don't seek out mental health services is very, very important. And especially for students, you know, students bring All those life events, they're going through divorce. In nursing, we're about 90% female. There's a lot of nurses who suffer from domestic violence. And how do you work on that and make sure that we can get our students out of that situation? We have uh, social workers. We have academic advisors. We have psychologists on staff that students can reach out to. We've negotiated rates with uh, local hotels to allow students who come forward with domestic violence issues that we can give them a, a week in a hotel if they need to get to a safe place. But again, if we didn't address those social issues, students wouldn't be able to be as successful as they are. Emily, do you have any thoughts on that? My journey thus far in nursing, I have witnessed single parents, uh, people who've come from very bad background, people who were in their cars and would come into school and clean up before class. My fellow peers use the hotels very often. And also a little program, I'm not sure the name of it, but it's just like you get a gas buddy card. So it's very hard to work during nursing school. You either work or you go to class. And if you miss a percentage of class, you're kicked out of the quarter. But if you don't go to work, you don't make money to buy gas. (laughs) So I have witnessed weekly students, they will get a gas buddy card to help them afford gas to commute. And the food program, I can promise you as an insider, I see these works coming into play and they benefit each one of us, every single one of us. I'd totally forgotten about the gas buddy and students who show a need for gas money. Each campus gets gas cards to present to students. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Can I add something briefly to Emily's comment about food scarcity? I I can just remember back several years, this was in uh, one of our other campuses in Texas, And I noticed that there were a couple of students that during lunchtime, they didn't have any food to eat. So we started this Forgot Your Lunch program, and it was a way to not embarrass people if they needed to get a lunch. And employees would donate, the school donated, uh, students would donate to the Forgot Your Lunch program, and eventually we set up a food bank. So Emily, what are your thoughts regarding the opportunity that a nursing school in Eastern Kentucky has brought you and what things have helped you be able to be resilient, have that grit to make it through uh, as far as you are? Yes, ma'am. I have met with academic leaders. I have met with them to, I guess you could call it tutoring or, you know, just one-on-one help. You know, they always tell you nursing school is hard, but no one tells you exactly how hard. So those I have used one every single quarter, personally, and I don't think I would be here without that. And the ARH scholarship, it has been such a blessing. It's a win-win. I get a promised job for at least two years while my debt is being paid. That is a huge blessing. And then as you talked about, you know, opening a nursing school in this rural area, that's another blessing. There are so many of us, when we graduate from my area, we have to leave home if we expect to be anything of ourselves. And and I hate that. You know, our families are here. This is where we want to be. Most of us don't want to leave our family. And so now that we have the Galen and Hazard and now the Galen and Pikeville, you know, that's just a commute. You can go and you can come back home. I myself was a high school dropout and a single mom and came from a very impoverished city in Eastern Kentucky. 
And never did I ever think that I would be able to go to college. One, I couldn't afford it. Number two, I didn't think I would be able to stay in the program long enough because I was a single mom. How do I manage daycare? How do I manage transportation? So all those things enter into your mind when you're wanting to go to nursing school and and then realizing that the student of today has lots of other needs than maybe when I went to school. Uh, Watish, is there any other wraparound services that you provided? We also, to make things easier for employees, provided free meal subsidies each day, which is something that we were super proud of, not just because we were able to provide employees with meals, but also because it was in partnership with a collective of 20 locally owned restaurants. So when you think about the notion of equity and access to do community investment work, it's also figuring out how you can strengthen others around. So pretty significant for small business to be able to provide meals for upwards of 500 people a day. That can be groundbreaking to their kind of infrastructure and how they produce revenue, especially as you think about them trying to recover from the pandemic. A lot of the restaurants locally are still only open a few days a week. So having Discover and other companies locally or other people in the neighborhood helps to bolster that too, because not only do people come work in the neighborhood, but they also come and have meals in the neighborhood as well. And providing a meal, you know, your employees are getting a nice meal at least once a day. And that's the same thing where students are concerned as well. I just think that's amazing. Yeah. When you think about just this conversation in general, it may be easier for the healthcare field to care about you know, their employees' health, because that's by mission or by definition, you know, almost what you do. I think it's very uncommon for that to be kind of the plight of individuals and financial services, et cetera. But the reality is, in order to sustain a workforce that's thriving and healthy and, and working hard for the organization, you have to care about more than just um, the company's bottom line. You have to make investments in people as well. And through that investment in people, they'll have enough to give back to your organization. But I think more now than ever, the pandemic has taught us the value in companies joining that conversation to figure out how to meet the whole needs of an individual versus just only on the individual kind of to leave their burdens at the door, focus on their job. I I think there is a, a blend of both that is more prevalent now than ever before. And going back to healthcare during the pandemic, it really took a toll on nurses and caregivers in general. We are trying our best to instill in our students that you've got to take care of yourself and seek out the services you need. Because if I'm not well, then I cannot take care of others. Uh, We provide a program called Compassionate Connected Care. And the premise behind Compassionate Connected Care is the caregiver has to take care of themselves. And we have a group of curriculum specialists who are taking the content, and this is something that hospitals use to help their caregivers uh, focus on caring for themselves. We are integrating that compassionate connected care throughout our nursing program. And so the concept of self-care will be threaded in each of the courses because, Watis, you said it earlier, you know, in healthcare, we have ready access, but we may be the last ones to use that. And so by teaching our students how to access those things, all the people that they come in contact with, whether it be family members, patients, friends, or others, they can actually instill some of that learning in their communications with those people. I mean, it's not super surprising to me that healthcare workers have a hard time taking care of themselves as a priority. And I could imagine that, you know, in the healthcare field, by design, you are a person who likes to essentially take care of others. You know, when we were in the middle of the pandemic at Discover, it was very intriguing and interesting that everybody kind of working from home, et cetera, you naturally thought that people would start to take more time for themselves. But what we started to hear was the day started bleeding together for everybody. There was no separation of work and personal. You left your bedroom just to go log on to your work computer and you left much later in the evening out of your work area or your space because it was convenient and it was easy and taking care of yourself and your family priorities became less. So we instituted things like no meeting Wednesdays and the corporate day of wellness where there were 
experts to come in and host yoga classes and different seminars to get people to focus on wellness. And I think in the healthcare industry, it's something that you have to almost have a routine cadence and discipline around. The other thing I add, especially as a leader is, How well I take care of myself and model that behavior for the team is how well the team will take care of themselves. And so if they feel as though I'm always online at midnight sending emails, et cetera, they start to model those behaviors. Um, If they see me skipping out on meals or scheduling over my lunchtime, they feel obligated to do the same thing. And so it's important that I have healthy practices as a leader to say, you know, the lunch hour is protected. While I may be on my computer at midnight, I'm going to set a reminder for the email not to go out until 8 a.m. during normal work hours so that others don't feel an obligation to respond in that moment because that time was most convenient for me to send the note. And so I think establishing healthy routines as a leadership team helps make that a little bit more embedded within the, the cultural fabric of the organization, right? You know, I love sharing with my team what I do on my day off, et cetera, because it inspires them to try to do things similar and encourages them to do things similar for themselves. I have participated in probably over, you know, 150 conversations in the last couple of years about how companies make investments. And I think that there's a lot of notions around like, is it better to make a people-based investment or a place-based investment? And my answer is, is simple. The answer is both. You know, when you think about quality of life, it's the investments that people have made in us, but it's also evident in the ecosystem of where we live, where we work, where we play. All of those things fit together for us to have a healthy ecosystem. You know, I wouldn't discourage any individual from doing one versus the other, but I think having the conversation for it to be an and is is very critical to, to make sure that team members like Emily and others don't have this barrier of transportation. No matter where you live, no matter where you work, no matter where you go to school, you should have access to everything you need to live a fruitful and sustained life. And so my hope is that someone listening will feel a little bit more motivated or inspired to think through how do they make an investment that's not the easiest or the fastest or the cheapest for the company, But what's the right thing to do to make the appropriate um, investment in people, which will ultimately not just be good for the individual, but it'll also be good for their business, too. I'm just thinking back to the conversations that I had when we started the school in Hazard in 2017 and uh, talking to the county judge executive, Scott Alexander. If you go to an economics class, you know, the driver of the economy is healthcare, roads and education. And they had this great hospital there. They're working on the road system. The education was lacking. And so being able to bring that there, infuse that piece of the equation into the community. The one thing that I loved when I would have frequent conversations with him, he would say, well, we've been able to get a steak and shake to move into the community. And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, probably to somebody that lives in a larger city, but it was a really big deal down there. He was able to entice companies, restaurants, and even retail stores to move into the community because in our first 18 months that we were open there, we infused about $5 million into the local economy, which was huge because the coal mining industry had pretty much, uh, is non-existent right now. And you had a lot of, of coal miners who were displaced and they, a lot of them were the sole breadwinners of their family. And many of them had college degrees. They just, after they reached a college degree, if they wanted to move back home and, and make a decent living, they had to go in the coal mines. And so this gives them an alternative to make about the same amount of money that a coal miner would make, use part of that degree that they earned. Many of them had degrees in business or or something else and use some of those credits towards their nursing degree and uh, and start a new career path. But the infusion of the revenues into the economy was really, really important. People were eating there more. People were buying cars there, shopping there. And those are things that sometimes, especially in education, we don't think about the impact on the community 
that we probably should, but it had a larger impact on the community than we can even measure at this point. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite things about the work that we um, embarked on in Chatham was this idea or this notion that we wanted to hire at least 80% of our employees within five miles of the center. And that's really to make sure that this doesn't become another gentrification exercise, that people who had access to the jobs are the individuals who really needed it versus it being people traveling from other parts of the city or the state that have options for meaningful employment. And that within itself was exceptionally significant if you think through the ability for people to not just live in their neighborhoods, but also work in their neighborhoods, go to church in their neighborhoods, have a grocery store in their neighborhoods. All of those things matter when you think about a healthy neighborhood or ecosystem. So I always say that the work that we did in Chatham wasn't anything transformative. It was trying our best to amplify the work that was already happening through dedicated organizations that have been serving the South side of the city for an exceptionally long time. One thing that we're seeing, which we're very, very proud of is our student body is more diverse than the communities in which we have our campuses. Our faculty match the diversity of the community. But one thing that we need to do is we want to be able to create a pathway for anybody that wants to become a nurse. And a couple of things that we do through the admission process removes a lot of those obstacles, such as waiting lists, or you have to have a 3.5 GPA to get in. We have a rolling admission, which is basically first come, first serve, because if we have selective admission, that means I may have a 3.0 GPA and, you know, applying for the nursing program and I applied first, but somebody comes in behind me and has a 3.5 GPA, they jump over me and get the slip bot and I don't. By having this rolling admission, it's first come, first serve, which allows students who maybe would have been placed on a waiting list to be able to get into the program. And so I think education as a whole needs to start thinking about in, in what are those obstacles that we put in front of people who have the grit and desire and determination to become a nurse? What are those obstacles that we put in front of them that prevent them from reaching their goal and dreams? Nursing historically hasn't been a very diverse profession. And we are putting a lot more focus on that because patients in the hospital want to see people that know them culturally. And by creating a more diverse nursing workforce, it definitely helps that. You know, investing in diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of the best decisions you can make for your business. As I've coached leaders, spent time with leaders, sat around tables where this topic is being discussed, is I I think it starts with the innate belief. It's like, what do you have to believe to know that your organization is better off because of diverse perspectives? And oftentimes when I see teams that are lacking diversity, it's, it's not lost on me that in their personal lives, there's probably a lack of diversity and other things. And so there isn't this belief that it's necessary. And if people believe that they become better because of diverse perspectives, and if you think about some of the greatest sports teams or businesses or corporations, they always speak to the magic and the diversity of perspectives and experiences that makes their team exceptionally well-rounded. And I do think that any company that doesn't prioritize diversity, not as a policy or response to affirmative action, but because it's a core belief, they miss out on benefits that the company could and should have, but it starts with the belief. Can I add something briefly? Fortunately, I had a lot of people who who rallied behind me and helped support me through my journey. And had I not had them, I don't know what exactly I would have done to get through nursing school. And one thing that I realized was that nursing changed my life. And um, Galen, the college that I work for, our vision statement is we change the life of one to care for the lives of many. I'm a living testament to that vision statement because nursing did change my life. And I was able to do things with and for people that I never would have been able to engage in had I not gone into nursing. And so when I decided to move into education, I really wanted to give back to the communities that had 
individuals that were in the same situation that I was in. And I'm very fortunate. You know, I do get to uh, speak to students quite frequently, and I like to share my story because we never know by looking at somebody what their journey is and what situation may prevent them from being able to finish. And so how do we create an environment where students can thrive, be resilient, and finish their programs so they can change their lives and then touch the lives of others? Special thanks to our guests, Audrey Dinker, Wati Scathings, and Emily Fairchild for inviting us to listen in and learn what's working to build our communities, workforces, and businesses and how providing wraparound services is key in helping people succeed and thrive in their education and careers so they can improve their lives and touch the lives of others. Among economists, some of my favorite people, there's an ongoing debate about the best way to address opportunity, social mobility, poverty, and inequity, and meet the needs of a community. Should there be more investment in people, in their schooling and health and welfare, or in places, things like infrastructure, amenities, or incentives that would attract businesses to move into a neighborhood? Given our high nursing vacancies, reduced access to health care, and projected nursing shortages, innovative and creative solutions are critical in expanding access to nursing education and building a diverse, thriving, and innovative nursing workforce. The data and stories are revealing. Opportunity, economic mobility, and healthcare access elude far too many people in far too many places. The factors that inhibit progress, schools, transportation, housing, job access, childcare, are the same factors comprising the social determinants of health and, as we learned from Watisse, the social determinants of employment. And they are improved by, as Audrea, Watisse, and Emily share, wraparound services, a broad range of community partnerships, and combining people-based and place-based investments. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.